I think it's kind of amazing how often we settle for stereotypes or slander about a person instead of taking the time to actually listen to what they're actually saying as opposed to listening to what other people are saying they are saying, which sometimes is a very different thing. That's what I did with Jesus. You know, for half of my life, I basically didn't know anything he actually said, but I heard what other people said about him, and I thought, well, I don't really want that. And I also have to admit, I had a stereotype about Christians. And, and, and I looked at what I thought Christians were, and I'm like, well, I don't want to be that either. And it's funny, we don't only just stereotype people. We stereotype words. Listen to this word. Dogma. Man, doesn't that just sound mean? Doesn't that just sound like a mean word? Dogma? Doesn't it sound rigid and uptight and uncreative? And then when you take the word dogma and the other word Christian and put those two together, Christian dogma, a dogmatic Christian, what do you think of then? What comes to your mind? Is it something like this? the cranky, old, self-righteous, judgmental guy pointing his finger at people, judging them, and of course he's using the Bible. And some of you know the problem for me, of course, is I realized one day, wait, I'm, I'm a cranky old guy. <laughs> like, like, that's who I am now. I hope I'm not him. I could be. But here's the tricky part. If in your heart your gut reaction is, all dogma is bad, that might be a sign that you're actually pretty old and maybe a little bit cranky. You guys who are older here, it's not the 70s or 80s anymore. That was the 70s and 80s. All dogma is bad. You shouldn't be dogmatic about anything. But I think there's a whole different mindset now at this moment in our culture. They might not call it dogma, but I believe there's a lot of people now who are discovering there is something missing in just being reasonable and rational. There's something missing in just refusing to take sides and just being moderate. It's not very inspiring. And there is some kind of virtue in taking a stand, in choosing a side, in holding on to your values, even if it costs you dearly. So what is going on in our culture in this moment? Well, if you want to know what a culture really values, look at its heroes. Look at who is lifted up as an example of a hero. So here's what I want to do. I want to show you a very fun, at least to me, wildly popular piece of pop culture, something that has a cult following, and I want you to pay attention to the values of this hero and what he says. So here's just a one-minute clip. I was not born on Mandalore. But you're a Mandalorian. Mandalorian isn't a race. It's a creed. This is the way. This is the way. This is the way. This is the way. If one chooses to walk the way of the Mandalore, you are both hunter and prey. How can one be a coward if one chooses this way of life? It's a creed. Is it now your code? This is the way. This is the way. I was a foundling. They raised me in the fighting corps. I was treated as one of their own. When I came of age, I was sworn to the creed.
if there was ever oh sorry about that this one Am I working? Kinda? All right. Sorry, guys. I'll try and hold this. Oh my gosh. Okay, so if there was ever a secular, progressive, high-tech company, it's Disney. But in Disney's show, The Mandalorian, there's a character that explicitly states that he has a religion, he adheres to a creed, and he obeys its rules as absolutes. In other words, he's committed to dogma. He's dogmatic. The followers of this religion literally say, this is the way. So what's going on here? I think something more than just a silly Star Wars sci-fi movie. Now, if this movie had been in 1970, let's try to put it in. Am I okay now? Okay, if this movie had been in 1970s, which the original Star Wars movies were, in 1977 was the very first one, I think that this guy would have been stereotyped as the villain. Some narrow-minded religious zealot whose adherence to his creed allows him to justify terrible things like genocide. But in this modern series, in these years, in culture... This guy is a hero, a hero. And how have modern young audiences responded to this character's creed, religion, his dogma? They're fascinated by it. They're really fascinated by it. They're intrigued by it. Why? Because the children of rationalists and the children of secularists have discovered that rationalism is not enough. Reason is not enough. Materialism is not enough. They discovered half of what Jesus taught last week, which is this, that man does not live by bread alone. What I'm going to ask, That would be great. It does. Connect. All right, let's try this. Okay, that's a little better. All right. Yeah. So here's the scoop if you've been able to follow my thread besides having your ears blown out, <laughs> this idea that they have discovered that materialism is not enough and reason is not enough. There's got to be more. They've learned half of what Jesus taught us last week, which is man does not live by bread alone. In other words, stuff is not enough. They hunger for a bigger story. Now, sometimes I hear you older folks, and by the way, I'm one of you, sometimes I hear older folks scolding younger adults, and I confess I do this to my own kids. And we say things like, you know, you take this incredibly high standard of living you have for granted. You have no idea how much you have, how much easier and more luxurious life is now than when I grew up. And you guys were right, right? The physical comforts, the standard of living, the technological power, the access to information, the variety and quality of foods I have access to now, I had none of that when I was growing up. When I was growing up, nobody had air conditioning. We viewed that as this outrageous, ridiculous, overly self-indulgent luxury. But before all us old folks get smug, Here's the thing. Yes, it's true 
that a lot of younger adults take these things for granted, but that also means they're not impressed by them. Not impressed by a lot of physical stuff the way someone who never had it is. They don't fall as easily for the lie that if you just work and work and work and get a whole lot of stuff, then you'll be happy. They are discovering at a younger age that stuff is not enough. And that is a good thing. And so in this cultural moment, I think people are looking for something more, looking for a bigger story, an adventure they can be part of, something that really, really matters. And isn't that a good thing? Well, yes, it is. It's a, it's a beautiful instinct. It's a legitimate instinct. But here's the thing. Unfortunately, it can be so easily manipulated. I think the problem now is not so much that people are rejecting the idea of all dogmas like people were in the 70s and 80s. Rather, I think we're all becoming too dogmatic. I think the problem now is not so much that people are rejecting the idea of creeds and dogmas, but rather that we're choosing the wrong ones. Ones that promise a better world, but which end in anger and hatred and cynicism and ultimately despair. So this morning we are going to study a very different kind of dogma, the dogma of Jesus. Is it weird for you to even hear those two words together, Jesus and dogma? We're gonna look at some of the rules, laws, and creeds that Jesus teaches as absolutes, as dogma, and they are found in a teaching known as the Sermon on the Mount. Now, the Sermon on the Mount, it covers, it covers chapters 5 through 7 in the Gospel of Matthew. We are working each week through another chapter of Matthew. And so today we're only focusing on chapter 5, but even if we tried to do all of chapter 5, you could spend a year. You could spend a year on how many amazing things are in here. So what I'm going to do today is focus on one thread one thread that ties into everything we've been talking about here in chapter 5. So, in chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says this, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Man. You know, it's funny, with all of us, I think, new always sounds better. New always sounds better. Why? Because it has no track record. We tend to think when we see a problem, the thing to do is something new. Jesus is directly confronting that, and he's confronting a lot of people, both then and now. People who say the Old Testament law is useless, that with the coming of Jesus, we've been freed of things like trying to obey the Ten Commandments, that now because of the cross, we don't have to comply with this archaic mortality, morality, because we're covered by grace. Well, you need to kind of show me how that goes with what Jesus just said. He literally said... I did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. And at a minimum, what he's saying is what's right and wrong has not changed. Like, he's not going to come and fulfill something unless it was good and working to begin with. Like, it's like, okay, this is good, now I'm going to fulfill it. That's the implication here. Jesus is not throwing out the old and starting from scratch. He is not trying to be original. The law of God, the morals and rules that God calls us to live by, when God says to you and me, this is the way, that wasn't intended to be a mean, bad, scolding, litmus test, a way to judge and reject other people based on some heartless regulations. It was a gift, a gift saying, hey, when you live this way, life works pretty well. Life is good. Life has meaning. And Jesus implies that these things stand for all time or at least to the end of the world. So that's pretty long. So 
At this point, those of you who are rule followers are loving this. Christina, yeah, you're loving this. Yeah, rules and order, and let's keep them, and that's what we need to do. And those of you who are really legalistic are like, yeah, that's right. I've got a lot of rules, and and I even have some rules for you I'd like to share. If you would only live the way I think you should live, everything would be much better. What we need around here is a little more rules and coloring within the lines, you know, coloring correctly, the right way. But then look at what Jesus does in verse 21. He says, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, wait, do you hear the audacity But I tell you, where did they hear do not murder? In the Ten Commandments, the very center of God's word. The very thing Jesus said will never go away is always true. He's saying, you've heard that, but now I tell you this. And now it appears he's going to contradict it. What the heck is going on here? Think about the audacity. But I tell you. In the Bible, when you go look through the Bible, what normal, moral, humble people say is things like, it is written. In other words, they're not standing on their own authority. They're they're referring humbly to the scripture of the past and saying, it is written. Or they say, thus saith the Lord. In other words, they humbly are pointing to what God has told them, not saying, I'm the authority. Here's a guy standing up and saying, you know everything else? No, I'm telling you the truth. It's my way. My way or the highway. In fact, Jesus goes on and says, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of God. So what's going on here? What, how, do you, how do you put these two things together? Well, there's a beautiful little verse in Isaiah 4.21 that says this. The Lord will exalt the law and make it honorable. Honorable. That's what he's doing. He's redeeming the law. The law had become bent and twisted. It had become fossilized, hard, and inhuman over time. People were living more by the letter of the law than the spirit of the law. And this is always the case with every dogma in any culture. Over time, if you're not careful, it fossilizes, it gets hard. People miss the big picture. It becomes the letter of the law rather than the spirit. And so Jesus isn't changing the law. He's returning its honor, bringing back the understanding that God originally had meant. And those of you who know the Bible may know that many scholars see the Sermon on the Mount as Jesus' commentary on the Ten Commandments. As you walk with us through here, see how you can pick every one of the Ten Commandments and Jesus breathing fresh life into it, redeeming it calling us to this higher thing. And what you see is the Ten Commandments were mostly about behaviors, and Jesus says, oh, no, no, I want more from you. I want your heart. It's your motive. He, he takes the law, and then he cranks it up even more challenging. So look again at what he says. He's talking about the Ten Commandments. He's talking about the law, and he says, you've heard it said, do not murder, but I say to you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, and that's like saying, you're a jerk, or you idiot. When you say even that, you are answerable to the Sanhedrin. That's the courts. Anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Holy cow. What's the worst thing you've ever called somebody? I've called people a lot worse than a fool. Man, how do we understand this? Jesus says that if you even despise another person enough to call them a fool or a jerk, you've committed a crime so great that it's worthy of hell. Now, Remember the vision of that cranky old guy we started out with who was looking down and judging you and despising you? Jesus is saying in real Christianity, despising and looking down on people is completely forbidden. That is not the way. This is the way. So a person who is judgmental and despising 
I want you to hear this, is actually rejecting the dogma of Christianity. Okay, okay, but, but, but what if the other person really is a jerk? <laughs> what, if, what, what if they really are wrong and all you want is a little justice? Dropping to verse 38. You have heard it said, he goes on. Again, you have heard it said, you have heard it said, but I say to you, you have heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. What's fair is fair. But I tell you, do not resist the evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. And if you read the scripture this week, you know he talks all about forgiving, forgiving, forgiving. Look how far beyond fair Jesus goes. He's saying when someone slaps you in the face, which is an insult, don't do what's fair, which would be to insult them back. Take it. And look what he's saying about people. You know, it's one thing to say to offer something to people. Hey, I have this. Would you like it? That's different than someone going, hey, give me that. Jesus is saying, give it to them. How far beyond fair is he taking us? And later he, he, he goes into this idea of forgiveness and he says to, to refuse to forgive is to not go my way. So again, think about the angry, judgmental, dogmatic, old man image that we've been given of Christianity. Jesus is saying real Christianity is about choosing to be forgiving and gracious and generous and giving. This is the way. This is the way. So a person who is not forgiving, who is holding on to their anger, who is not peaceful and generous, is actually rejecting the dogma of Christianity. So, is there someone who owes you something? Somebody who owes you money? Or an apology? Are you still holding it against them? Man, you talk about a difficult code. We talk about a hard creed to live by. And then... Then, just when we're like, oh, Jesus, man, I don't know if I can go this far, he cranks it up to the ultimate in verses 43 to 44. He says, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Like, literally, God, would you bless them? Now, Think of all the terrible things that have been done in the name of Christianity. And terrible things have been done in the name of Christianity. But it's what Jesus says that defines what true Christianity is. This is the way. So anyone who hates their enemy and refuses to love them and pray for them has rejected the true dogma of Christianity. Any action not in keeping with the teachings of Jesus is not Christianity, it is counterfeit. Or think of the terrible things that people say about Christianity, perhaps believing them without ever actually studying the original sources. You guys, this is the original source. Jesus is the ultimate original source. Not the Pope, not the church, not some organization, Jesus. Do you wanna know what Christianity is? It's whatever Jesus says it is. That's what it is. Not what some self-righteous, pompous jerk says it is. Notice how I just broke <laughs> the laws. I just broke it right there. See how, see how hard it is to live this way. But here's the deal. The next time someone tries to draw an ugly picture of Christianity in front of you, you take them to this verse. What is the Christian way? This is the way. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. All right, all right, all right. So, but why does Jesus ask so much of us? Well, he tells us in the very next verse, verse 45. Why does he call us to this incredible code, this difficult creed? That you may be sons and daughters of your Father in heaven that you may be like God himself. 
He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sets the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Jesus wants you to act like you are a noble member of the household of God, that you are part of this fellowship. This is the way. To live with your head lifted high because you live with honor. You live with honor and you strive to live in the code of God. What do the sun and the rain do? They cause things to grow and flourish. That's what this means. That God causes things to grow and flourish. What does this mean? It means God allows both the righteous and the unrighteous, the good people and the bad people to flourish. Out of his mercy, out of his grace. Can you imagine if he withheld blessings based on how bad you were? (laughs) Or how much you take what you've been given for granted? Talk about grace. God gives blessings to those who don't deserve it. And so if we're going to be like God, if we're going to be like Jesus, if we are going to walk in the way, we are to give blessings to those who don't deserve it. This is the way. Now, when Jesus says, but I say to you, he's giving us commands, he's giving us rules that are to be obeyed, even when it's hard, even when it's inconvenient, and here's the hard part, even when I don't feel like doing it. I still have it in my head that if something's good and right, it should feel good and right. But a lot of times, the right thing to do just doesn't feel good. That's just the way it is. And that's when I have to say to myself, no, this is the way. So how do we sum up what we've looked at this morning? What does the dogma of Jesus include? Jesus talks about a lot of other things. He talks about human sexuality. He talks about morality. But the core, the center, the heart is found right here. We are to love and help our neighbors. We are to even love our enemies and wish for their flourishing. We are not to label or despise others. We are to take insults and abuse rather than demand what is fair. We are to be generous and merciful rather than demand what is fair. This, this is the way. So, what do you think of this dogma? How nasty and narrow-minded and judgmental would a person be who lived this way? Well, they, they wouldn't be. This is the way. How many detractors of Christianity would come anywhere near this standard of actual kindness? How many of them would even want to follow this code? How many of them are actually quite judgmental and despising of Christians? Now, you might say, yeah, yeah, okay, Langdon, but guess what? A lot of Christians don't live up to that standard. And you know what I say to you when you say that? You're wrong. No Christian lives up to that standard. Not a one. The only person who ever lived up to this standard was Jesus, the Son of God. Light of light. True God of true God. So we look at the standard that Jesus sets for us. Who can actually live for it? Only Jesus can. So what do we do with commandments that we know we will often fail, even with the purest heart and the best efforts? Well, jumping back to verse 19, Jesus says this, whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. You guys, it's okay to want to be great. It's a good thing to want to be great. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. you got to know how outrageous that was at that time. He's talking to these people and going, you know the people you think are the most virtuous? The most virtuous? If you're not more virtuous than them, you're not going to heaven. Oh man, what is he talking about? Well, notice those words, teach and practice in verse 19. Teaching is good but actually doing is what really matters. Note he doesn't say, unless your doctrine and theology surpasses that of the Pharisees, no, rather he says your righteousness, in other words, your actual doing, it's not enough to have the right ideas, it's living the life, it's actually doing and being that really matters. But what happens when we compare how we actually live to what Jesus calls us to? I mean, think about the last time you you had a name for somebody in your head 
Well, the reformers, the reformers like Luther and Calvin, rightly pointed out that the earnest person who tries to walk in this way is constantly reminded of their need for God's grace and mercy, that these commandments are like a mirror in our face, and they show us how imperfect and selfish we are, and so when they're understood the right way, they drive us to the cross, they drive us to the feet of Jesus, and we fall upon his feet and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, that's all true, but that's not enough. The Gospel Coalition website puts it this way. While the impossibility of earning salvation and the need for radical grace are true from a whole Bible perspective, this misses the genre, the point, and the goal of this sermon. This sermon is wisdom from God, inviting us through faith to reorient our values and our vision and our habits from the ways of external righteousness and what other people see to a wholeheartedness toward God. This isn't law, it's gospel. It's Jesus inviting us into the life of God's kingdom, both now and forever. So, to end, let's go back to the beginning. What is the definition of this word that we dislike so much, dogma? Here's one definition. What's dogma? An official system of principles or tenets concerning faith, morals, beliefs. So was Jesus dogmatic. In John 15, he says this, Obey my commands. In other words, this is the way. Jesus puts out his teaching as absolute, unchanging, not open to debate. You see, Jesus is the one person who truly has a right to be dogmatic. Because when we human beings get too dogmatic, what usually comes? Bondage and misery. But with Jesus' dogma, what comes? Freedom and joy. He calls us to this radical, wild adventure of acting and being in a very different, very strange very beautiful way, he says, this, this is the way. You guys, Jesus is not one more option. He is the only option to the miserable dogma of special interest groups, all of which are vying for power and control, all of which will use you as their tool to achieve their ends. But you see, for, you, for Jesus, you are the end. You're why he came. He would go to the ends of the earth to find you and to save you. I believe true hope, real hope, the kind of hope that can stand up to the heartache and the tragedy of this life is found nowhere else. This is why we call Leverington, what? A community of hope in Christ. So, in chapters 5, 6, and 7, Jesus lays it all out. So I'm hoping this week you will read chapter 6 as we prepare for next Sunday. He lays it all out in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, here it is. This is the way. How will you respond? Amen. We're going to end worship this morning by singing a very old classic hymn. And when I think about this hymn, um, it, it's, they'll know we're Christians by our love. So if you grew up in church, you might have remembered this. What's key to understand about this is, this is not triumphant. This is not people going, people are going to be so amazed by us. We're going to be so loving that people are going to be amazed because we're so cool. No, it, it's saying, brothers, sisters, this is what we're called to. This is the way. Challenging each other stri to strive for what we are called to do. This is a call to the adventure of following Jesus. This song is basically the Christian version of saying, this is the way.